Almighty God, Lord of the universe, we come before you as the body of Christ to praise you, to lift you up, to give you glory and honor and thanksgiving. Lord, we have worshipped you this morning and will continue to do so, not only in song, but in the observance of the ordinance of your supper. And then in our fellowship. Lord, we ask that you speak to us today. Every person here needs to hear from you, including me. Bless the preaching of your word. You'll let your word be a comfort to our hearts and instruction to our souls and conviction in our sin. I pray that you would build up your church, not just in numbers, but in faith and obedience. Oh, Lord. Father, our world just continues to seem to implode. And just in times like this when it seems like no one is in charge. We take solace in the absolute truth that you are indeed in charge. And that we know the end of the story, Lord, and pray for it to come with the return of your son. But in the meantime, Lord, the church has much to do. We have a job. And we're not doing it like we should to go out and tell others about the salvation that is available in Jesus Christ. The forgiveness of sins by your grace alone. Let us be found more obedient in that aspect. Open our minds and our hearts today to hear what you have to say. Minister to us as only you can. And may you be lifted up and may we know you better as a result. And we ask all of this in the name of the world's only Savior, Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Good morning. morning. You guys are singing pretty good today. Sounding all right. And I have some announcements to make. Uh, First of all, you'll find some envelopes in your bulletin. Uh, We're not begging you for money. We're just giving you the opportunity if you want to contribute in the Thanksgiving offering a little bit towards the cost of our big Thanksgiving banquet that's coming up the the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. Not that day before, but the previous week. Uh, That's right, right? Okay. And... You all get that? Sign up sheets out there. All right. And uh, we will not be having prayer meeting that night. Uh, we're going to eat instead. And we're very close to shipping out our Operation Christmas Child boxes. And uh, if you want to give towards the postage on those, then that, this envelope is for that. Any amount is fine, uh, just to help allay some of the cost of that. And uh, all right, I did that, Brenda. I get all these sticky notes every Sunday morning. You got to tell them this. You got to do this. You got to. Um, there will. You'll be finishing packing shoe boxes after meeting. Which meeting? Okay, for the women's ministry. Yeah. When Saturday, ten thirty. Okay. All right, and then. Uh, we're still cutting wood out there to give away to people, and uh, we could use a few more hands. If you could come out, you don't have to come out on Saturdays. You know, if you've got a chainsaw or you know want to get access to our wood splitter, if you know how to use it, we can get you access to that anytime. And the sooner we get all that wood cut and split, the sooner we can start delivering it. Because as you may have noticed this morning, it's a little bit chilly. I'm sure some people are already burning up their wood stoves, so uh, we need to get that going and. Um, um, I'm going to have this announcement in here every week about our theological library, which is right behind that wall. Uh, we've got it pretty, pretty well stocked with books. If you'd like to research or study any particular biblical or theological uh, subjects, 
Uh, we even have a computer in there. And has that computer been hooked up and running yet, Brenda? Okay, so you can even go online, and uh, pretty soon I'll be loading some uh, connections on there for some different uh, websites that you might can use in your researching of biblical subjects. We even have a very nice, comfortable reading chair in there. So it's kind of nice. And anything else? Ken, you think of anything else? Yeah, Brenda's always got something else. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. Of course, that's nothing unusual. This is a surprise attack, right? Hey, guys. What is this? You're the best. Thank you, Pastor Russ. Oh, yeah. They even put the best again down at the bottom. Yeah, I got to do it twice. Thank you for helping us grow. Look at that. That's beautiful. That is beautiful. Thank you so much. Yeah. You've got good teachers, too. That's nice. I was not expecting a certificate, a gift card for Pastor Appreciation Month uh, to my favorite place in the world, uh, Maine Military Supply. I said, I'm getting another gun. Karen says, nope. <laughs> All right, I'll get bullets. <laughs> Whatever. Of course, $400 might buy two or three boxes at, these days, but thank you. That was very nice. A what? Yeah, maybe so. Not too many clothes. <laughs> I'm not using my gift card for her. <laughs> All right, so that should do that, and um, uh, we appreciate you all being here uh, and I know we have some people traveling. There might even be, still be some folks out with that little bug that's been going around. But, you know, that happens. And um, uh, we know that God got you here today. And you are not here because you decided to come here. You're here because God wanted you here. And uh, that means he's got a purpose or a reason to have you here. And it may be some blessing from the worship or some uh, blessing from the, the preaching of the Word of God. I don't know. Or maybe the fellowship. But we are also having our Lord's Supper observation at the end of this service. And then we're having our love feast, we call it, uh, or in common terminology, uh, potluck. And there's a bunch of food in there, so uh, we appreciate you consider staying behind and helping us eat it all. And uh, last Sunday of every month we do this. So we're in Genesis 31 again. Finishing up this chapter, we'll be starting in verse 25. I wish I knew what to say to you about what happened this week in Lewiston. One thing we've been learning in our study through the book of Genesis is that God does work through all circumstances to achieve his goals, his plans, and his purposes. He does this in spite of us sometimes. We have seen how faithless and conniving the patriarchs have been at times, frequently trying to help God along with his promises. God is indeed sovereign over all things, and sometimes that puts us in a quandary. What possible reason could God have for a crazed, bloodthirsty madman to blow away 18 people and wound 13? We all know that God allows us free will. 
And that, in turn, facilitates evil. While it's true that God can work through the evil acts of man to achieve his purposes, he does still allow the evil in the first place. Because to have no evil deeds in this world, he would have to take away our free will. God wants us to love him from our own free will, not perform for him like robots. Sometimes evil is the direct result of satanic forces at work, often using human agents to perform them. Rather than wondering why God allows Satan to do such hard things, we need to praise him that there isn't more of them. Surely in his great grace, God does indeed prevent some demonic acts from being carried out. But he still allows some. Why? Because we live in a fallen world. Every man, woman, and child is a sinner. And every institution of man is corrupted by sin. Remember that our first parents welcomed sin into the world. And we have perpetuated it through our sinful natures. As we studied in Sunday school this morning from the book of Job, who are we to question how God exacts his judgment on sinners? And how dare we condemn God for allowing these things? A man decided to do that probably under demonic influence or even demonic possession and how can we are possibly exactly according to God's plan what if to achieve God's purposes for the world a certain person has to pass away in a certain way at a certain time Like the butterfly effect, there could be future events or people that would have been affected by that person's continued life. It disturbs air currents just enough to cause a hurricane on our side of the planet. Now, this is just my feeble attempt to shine some light on possibly why the shooting in our state might have happened. I don't have all the answers. But I do know we serve a God who has an ultimate plan to to destroy all evil, sin, death, and the grave for all eternity. Amen? And this terrible crime reminds us of something John Calvin said, that the heart of man is the source of all sorts of evil. We should be praying for the families and the loved ones of the people who died. Many of whom we have come to know a little through the news. I'm sure they're all good people. Surely some of them are Christians who are now with Jesus. We should also, like Jesus at Lazarus' tomb, weep and mourn over death and continue to trust that God is resolving everything according to his plan which we may see come to fruition in our lifetimes coming on the heels of what happened in Israel especially on October 7th Lewiston is like a gut punch to Mainers so cling closely to those you love And do everything you can to bring them to faith in Jesus and never stop trusting God. I know that didn't have a whole lot to do with what we're preaching about today, but I felt like I needed to say something. Last week, 
we learn that Jacob had taken his wives, children, servants, and all his flocks to return to the land of his father, Isaac. He did this while Uncle Laban was away shearing his sheep. Now Jacob explained what he was doing to his wives, Leah and Rachel, and they agreed that it was time to go. After all, God had multiplied Jacob's flocks greatly at the expense of Laban's flocks. Now, well, when Uncle Laban learns of Jacob's deception and goes after him, today's text describes what happened when he caught up with him. Laban was not happy, but Jacob finally confronts him with how Laban had cheated him for 20 years. Remember, he had swapped Jacob's bride out on him on their wedding night. Who does that? Rachel then stole her father's household god figurines, and that is a very strange addition to this story. Finally, Jacob and Laban make a covenant, a kind of peace treaty between themselves, and Laban goes home. But Jacob was not out of the woods yet, as we will see in coming weeks. He got word that his estranged brother Esau was coming to greet him as he re-entered the promised land. Remember, Jacob had badly cheated Esau out of his inheritance and his father's blessing. So Jacob thought this could get ugly. And then a strange thing happened in the next chapter. Jacob wrestles God. This is one reason I love the Bible so much. It comes up with some surprising things that you would never expect. So let's, we're going to read portions of the text when we get to the next part, but I want to shed some light on, you know, these are ancient days we keep talking about. As far back as 4,000 years ago, their culture was completely different than ours. But people are people, aren't they? And so I like to try to find ways to look at the events of what we're talking about and compare them to similar events that we might see in our own lives. It's called bridging the contextual divide in preacher talk. So conniving Jacob had made an enemy of his deceiving Uncle Laban. They were two peas in the pod. Both of them were crooks. But since Jacob was to inherit the promise of God... God had his back and made him a wealthy man. I remember they measured wealth in those days by how many sheep and goats you had and even cows and camels. God now has called him to return to the land that he had promised his descendants. Sometimes we practice deceit in our dealings with others or it's practiced on us. God does not honor this behavior. And there will usually be a reckoning for it. But, but if we are God's chosen ones, and if you are a Christian, you are, then by confessing, unsaved people, people who don't know Christ, don't get this blessing. Sinners will act like sinners. Never be surprised at that. And deception and lies are part of being a sinner. In the past three or four years, we've grown to distrust just about anyone in government, education, and for some, in law enforcement. Completely unnecessary. But we were led to believe and obey orders that ended up crippling our economy. Some have believed the lie that all law enforcement officers are bad or that all white people are racist that America was founded and has been governed to keep people of color enslaved. And some have even rewritten our history to reflect these lies. Read George Orwell's book, 1984. That's all I'm going to say on that. Honesty is so important. We all agree that early in the pandemic, no one really understood how deadly that thing was going to be. We know now... And it was readily apparent early on that the only people that needed to be protected were those that had serious underlying conditions or certain elderly folks. There was no need for universal lockdowns. Our country is still weakened because of dishonesty and lies. 
It's important to seek out the truth diligently and not to live by lies. Let's look at verses 25 through 30. First point, I th the first thing I want to point out is that as Jacob was destined to return to the promised land, so are we promised by God for our own heavenly destination. Verse 25, and Laban overtook Jacob. Now Jacob had pitched his tent in the hill country, and Laban with his kinsmen pitched tents in the hill country of Gilead. Gilead is just northeast of Canaan. It's pretty close. It's on the other side of the Jordan River. It was hill country, and they had stopped there. And Laban said to Jacob, What have you done that you have tricked me and driven away my daughters like captives of the sword? Laban's going after Jacob with both barrels. Why did you flee secretly and trick me and did not tell me so that I might have sent you away with mirth and songs, with tambourine and lyra? And why did you not permit me to kiss my sons and my daughters farewell? Now you have done foolishly. Pretty good chewing out. Then he says, it is in my power to do you harm. Remember, he's got all his kinsmen with him. That means his small army of employees and family. But the God of your father spoke to me last night saying, be careful not to say anything to Jacob, either good or bad. That's the last thing we looked at last Sunday, that God had spoken to Laban and basically told him, don't do anything to Jacob when you meet him. And now you have gone away because you longed greatly for your father's house. But why did you steal my gods? Jacob longed for his father's house. When the covenant was first established through the patriarch Abraham, he promised that Canaan, which is now known as Palestine and Israel, was going to belong to his descendants, that they would inherit the land and live there forever, as long as they adhered to the covenant that God had established with them. He said, I will be your God, I will give you great numbers of descendants, and you will inherit this land, but you've got to let me be your God. So we have seen times in Israel's history where they have disobeyed God, they've rebelled against God, and God has judged them. A couple of, well, there are a couple of times. First time was the Assyrians invaded, and thousands of Israelites were taken into captivity and taken to other countries. The same thing happened a couple of centuries later when the Babylonians invaded Israel and took many of the people in Israel to Babylon as prisoners. They also destroyed Jerusalem and the temple. So God will judge when necessary. But he did, does have a heavenly destination for us, much like the promised land that Jacob was going back to. He was going back to his father's house, but his father's house is in Canaan, the promised land. 20 years earlier, God had allowed Jacob to leave the promised land and go to Padanaram, which is in Mesopotamia, and he got his wives, he got his wealth, he got all of this. God was in all of that. We discovered that last week. We are also promised a land where all things will be made new. All things. When Jesus returns to take us out of this place and judge evil and the devil, we don't know how he's going to do this or what it's going to look like, but he's going to recreate the heavens and the earth into something new. He won't destroy the earth, but will somehow merge it with heaven, and it will be beyond description. I think that's one reason why we're not given a lot of description of it in the Scripture, because no words can possibly really describe it. Not because you're going to see but because you're going to be face-to-face -face with Jesus. For those believers who have already left this existence, or for those of us who would die before Jesus returns, our spirits are immediately with Jesus in the existing heaven, worshiping and praising and being with him. And when Jesus returns, these folks will get their new bodies along with us and live in the new creation with us. 
This is why we say we know the end of the story. We know that no, no matter how bad things get, or how petty things get, <laughs> it'll all be made right one day for those of us who are in Christ. God promises this to us. Now, I've said this a hundred times, and I'll say it a hundred and one times. God cannot lie. When God promises something, he will fulfill it. And what did he promise? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Pretty simple. Believe that Jesus Christ was and is the Son of God and that he died on a cross and took the punishment for your sin and mine. In our place, if we believe that and that he was resurrected again the third day to bring us into eternal life, then our sins are forgiven. And we are his. We are his children. And we will be with him for eternity. But it's not some easy believism. This belief in the Lord Jesus Christ requires that we follow him that we learn his teachings, we learn what is expected of us, and we obey to the best of our ability, we repent of our sins when necessary, and we walk this earth until he takes us home, living for Christ. You see, all people are sinners, everybody. Well, you say, I'm not so bad. If you've ever violated even one of God's rules, decrees, commandments, you're guilty. And being a holy, pure, and just God, he cannot just overlook that guilt. It has to be punished. But his justice is perfect. But he loved us so much, he came up with a way, and that's through Jesus Christ. Some of you say, well, every Sunday, Pastor, you tell us that. Yeah, I don't know about you, but I need to hear it. I need to be reminded of God's grace and his initiative in extending it to me who didn't deserve it, can never deserve it, but by his love, his grace was operative in bringing us to Christ. second thing I want to point out in verses 31 through 37 is that as Rachel was still attracted to her pagan beliefs, so are we tempted by the world to be tempted to worship false gods. This is a bit of a bizarre little incident that's inserted into this story. Let's read starting in verse 31. Now, Laban had just said, why did you steal my gods? So what is he talking about? Well, remember that in Mesopotamia at that time, there was nothing but pagan religions. They had many gods that they worshipped, and they believed in a lot of uh, uh, very superstitious things. And they believed that these little figurines of human beings could be used in divination or learning the future, or uh, little statues of little gods could be worshipped. And this is what a household god is. They're little things like this. They're not one of these big things you set in the corner of the house. And so uh, Jacob answered and said to Laban, I left because I was afraid, for I thought that you would take your daughters from me by force. Now remember when he left with Laban's two daughters, his wives, Mesopotamian law at the time said that he could not take them without their permission, their permission, the two wives. So presumably Laban could have stepped in and prevented him from taking the wives. And... Uh, all of his wealth, he could have kept that. Anyone with whom you find your gods, this is Jacob saying, shall not live. He said, nobody here stole them. In the presence of our kinsmen, point out what I have that is yours and take it. Now, the next sentence is important. <laughs> now, Jacob did not know that Rachel had stolen them. Rachel, Rachel. So Laban went into Jacob's tent and into Leah's tent and into the tent of the two female servants, but he did not find them, the little gods. And he went out of Leah's tent and entered Rachel's. 
Laban felt all about the tent, but did not find them. And she said to her father, Let not my Lord be angry that I cannot rise before you, for the way of women is upon me. So he searched, but did not find the household gods. Sly, 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 Rachel. You see, Laban would have never thought that if she had her monthly visitor, that she would actually sit on his household gods because that women in those days who were having their monthly visitor were considered impure, unclean, and that would be to defile those gods. So Laban thought she would never. No, she's not sitting on them. There's no way. So Rachel fooled him. Uh, then Jacob became angry and berated Laban. Jacob said to Laban, what is my offense? What is my sin that you have hotly pursued me? For you have felt through all my goods. What have you found of all your household goods? Set it here before my kinsmen and your kinsmen that they may decide between us two. So the argument continues. So this is an odd little event. It doesn't seem to be a big deal. But nothing in the Bible is there without a reason. I think that Jacob's wives, having been raised in a pagan culture, still held on to their family beliefs, but also had some faith in Jacob's God. It isn't unusual in that culture to believe in multiple gods, even new ones. And maybe the Holy Spirit included this little story to remind us that God was still working on Jacob and his family. Folks, he's still working on me. I am so flawed. So are you. He's still working. You know, sometimes we hold on to our false gods. And we say, what gods? There are any number of things in our modern culture that constitute potential gods. Anything that we value higher then our relationship with God is a potential false God. Anything. Materialism, money, position and power, reputation, addictive substances, sex, your job, hobbies, sports, and even family can all be a God if we love and are dedicated to it more than we are to Christ. This world has many temptations that can lure us away. And we must be ever vigilant to guard our souls and resist. Remember, we have a victory over this world because Jesus has overcome the world by his crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension. Moving on to verse 38. We're going to see that when cheated and mistreated by others, we know that our God sees our affliction and will care for us. Jacob's continuing his chewing out of Laban. These 20 years I have been with you. Your ewes are female sheep and your female goats have not miscarried and I have not eaten the rams of your flocks. If he ate rams, I guess he meant he ate his own. What was torn by wild beasts, and I did not bring to you, I bore the loss of it myself. From my hand you required it, whether stolen by day or stolen by night. In other words, Laban held him totally accountable as the shepherd of, the, of his sheep. He ate it, ate the cost. There I was, by day the heat consumed me, and the cold by night, and my sleep fled from my eyes. These 20 years, I have been in your house. I served you 14 years for your two daughters and six years for the flock, and you have changed my wages 10 times. If the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac had not been on my side, surely now you would have sent me away empty-handed. Laban was a crook. God saw my affliction 
in the labor of my hands and rebuked you last night when he talked to him. Jacob's learning. The Bible encourages us to cast our cares upon Jesus. That means to put whatever in your life that is an affliction into his hands and leave it there. Not doing this implies distrust of his ability, affliction. Remember, Christ said to his disciples and to us that in this world there will be suffering. We should not be surprised when facing difficulties, difficulties, but only when we're not. This is because of a fallen, sinful world, but life's trials are also opportunities for us to once again trust in the Lord of grace in your past, where he's come through for you, should strengthen your faith in his future acts of grace. Therefore, those future problems are not worth worrying about because he's got this. It's also important to be realistic about our trials and tribulations. Sometimes what we call a problem is really not a big deal. I've seen that. Be discerning and carefully analyze a situation, and you may find that it really isn't worth getting all upset about. Your potted plant dies, so what? You get a flat tire, so what? Fix it. Sometimes our woe is me is self-caused. You might have no one to blame but yourself for your own problems. If that's the case, see what you can do to rectify it. Make it right. You can still go to God about it, but be sure and get your heart right with him if sin is involved. Or just ask him to help you make it things right. What's my favorite prayer? Jesus, help me. One of the most powerful prayers you can say. Now, sometimes other people have wronged you. Do what you can to reconcile with them. Pray for them. Hand it over to God and trust him to handle it. Finally, we come to covenant. Verses 43 through 55. All right, so this argument's been going on here. Laban accused Jacob of some things. Jacob accused Laban of some things. And obviously Jacob is not going to come back or give Laban all of his flocks and herds and daughters and sons. So they figure out a solution. Laban actually proposes it. Then Laban answered and said to Jacob, now he's still trying try one last time to get this in there that everything that Jacob has really belongs to him. The daughters are my daughters, the children are my children, the flocks are my flocks, and all that you see is mine. Really? But what can I do this day for these my daughters or for their children whom they have born? Stop right there. Do you remember Jacob worked for Laban for 14 years? Seven years for the first wife, another seven years for the second wife. And that was his wages. He was working for Laban as the shepherd of his flocks. And so Laban was supposed to take what he would have paid a shepherd to take care of his flocks and put it into a dowry for his daughters. Dowries were used in those, that culture and in some cultures today if, in case a wife was widowed or her husband left her or divorced her. This money was set aside to provide for her in her situation. Well, he just admitted right here there's no money in the dowry. What can I do for him? Also, we know from the last, last week and the week before that Jacob had basically taken all of Laban's flocks and herds through honest means, through selective breeding and such. So he admits that. Verse 44, come now, let us make a covenant, you and I, and let it be a witness between you and me. So Jacob took a stone and set it up as a pillar. And Jacob said to his kinsmen, gather stones. And they took stones and made a heap, and they ate there by the heap. 
when they would set up memorials for a covenant or for any other reason, it could have been an important event happened at a particular spot, they would make piles of stones. And then they would have a, a formal meal around the pile of stones as a ceremony or a ritual to uh, certify, in this case, a covenant. And uh, Laban called it, now I'm not even going to try to say that, uh, and Jacob called it Galid. They always name these memorials. Laban said, this heap is a witness between you and me today. Therefore he named it Galid and Mizpah, for he said, the Lord watch between you and me when we are out of one another's sight. In other words, I don't trust you as far as I can throw you, so I'm trusting that God will keep his eye on you and keep you straight. If you oppress my daughters, or if you take wives besides my daughters, although no one is with us, see, God is witness between you and me. Then Laban said to Jacob, See this heap in the pillar which I have set between you and me. This heap is a witness, and the pillar is a witness, that I will not pass over this heap to you, and you will not pass over this heap and this pillar to me to do harm. So it's a peace treaty. The God of Abraham and the God of Nahor, that's Abraham's father who worshipped pagans. The God of their father judged between us. So Jacob swore by the fear of his father Isaac. This is one of the rare times uh, God is referred to as the fear of Isaac. Right in the hill country, early in the morning, Laban arose and kissed, kissed his grandchildren and his daughters and blessed them. Then Laban departed and returned home, and we never hear from him again. See, the Bible's New Testament is just another way of saying New Covenant. Jesus came, Jesus came to fulfill the Old Testament covenant and, was made an, and has made a new one with his people. Simply stated, as I've already explained, God sent his one and only Son into the world in human flesh to live a perfect, sinless life and then to die on a cross for the sins of those he chose to experience salvation. The covenant is that if anyone believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that he died in their place, then God promises to forgive their sins, send them his Holy Spirit, and have an eternal home with him. For those of us in Christ, we know the end of humanity's story. But it's not really the end, is it? It's a restoration of our destiny as beings in perfect fellowship with God. Isn't it somewhat ironic that in the past few weeks we've been learning about the beginning of the nation of Israel and now they're fighting for their very existence? Have you thought about that? I know that God's chosen people is the church, but Israel is still special to him and will play a huge role in future events of the end times. Some theologians even believe that God will bring many Jews to Christ right before the end. Could it be that the Holy Spirit has led us to study Genesis so that we might understand more about what's going on in the Middle East? Or that we might realize this role of Israel in our futures? Clearly, the modern nation of Israel is not without fault. But they also do not deserve to be wiped out, as the Nazis tried to do. And they are the only democracy in that region, long-time strong allies of the U.S. We should not allow ourselves to be misled that Israel can do no wrong. But we also should realize they are an important land and people according to the word of God. He says that we should pray for the peace of Jerusalem. What we learned so far in Genesis is that God has called Abraham and his select descendants to be the conduit through which he will reveal himself to the world eventually through Jesus Christ. Also, that he, God, has been at work in the history of the Jews to preserve them and sometimes miraculously protect them. Read up on the 1973 war in Israel and you'll find out about the miracles that happened. Don't think for a minute 
that after all this history that God is going to allow Israel to be destroyed. He might bring some kind of judgment on them for rejecting their Messiah. But as in the Old Testament, he will always preserve a remnant of Abraham's descendants and will never take the land away from them permanently. I didn't really intend to go into this, but the Lord led me to it. No one knows how this war is going to play out. We're dealing with current events today, aren't we? Or what role the U.S. will end up playing in the course of it. Could it be that our ultimate purpose as a nation is to ensure that Israel continues to exist as a nation? It seems that could be true considering how many protesters there are in our streets and campuses rallying against the Jewish nation. The enemy, talking about Satan here, would love to bring mayhem to God's chosen ones and destroy as many as possible. There's no doubt in my mind that the animals that did the thing on October the 7th were demon-possessed. Anyone who supports what they did is allied with the monsters that did it and the evil demons that possessed them. Now, not all Palestinians are Hamas or Hezbollah. We should be praying for them too. Transition to the Lord's Supper now. We are 